All right, everyone. Hello. How are you guys all doing? Trying to get my camera situated here. There we go. Get it straight. All right. It's so good to see everyone. Happy Thursday. Once again, I try to go live every Thursday at 6 p.m. to talk to you guys. Um, tonight, to start out with, we have some announcements. So on Sunday, September 12th, I'm going to be doing a free live webinar on the dressage training scale. Um, you can sign up for the webinar here. It's going to be at www.ameliasdressageacademy.com forward slash training scale webinar. So be sure to sign up for that webinar. Let's see. Hi, Haley. Everyone wants to know about the horse. Maybe I'll talk about him later. Hi, Jackie and Aaron. So good to see all of you guys. So I'm trying a new thing where I'm going live on Facebook and on YouTube tonight. So we're going to test this out and see how it goes. Um, what else is new and exciting? Oh, a couple of things. So we have some like big anniversaries this month. It's September. I can't believe it's September already. But um a year ago in September, we started Amelia's Dressage Club, and that is my Facebook group. If you're not on it, you should be sure to join it. It has been, it was kind of an idea that I was playing around with, and my mom kind of enticed me to start it, and I was leery about what it would be, and it's been like such an amazing thing. You guys on the club are so amazing, and you're so supportive of one another, and the community that we have is just so incredible and so special. And it's funny because I actually learn a lot from you guys. Like when people post a question or something they're struggling with, I often like read through all the comments and it's just amazing how much even I learn. And I've started to take like a lot of the new videos that I have that are going to be coming out in the future for YouTube come from what happens on Amelia's Dressage Club and like questions that you guys have. Um, like next week, we're doing one on the right lead canner, the one on the half halt that actually came from someone's question on Amelia's Dressage Club. So the other thing that is super fun about Amelia's Dressage Club. I was just trying to think back. I don't know if any of you guys have memories, but one thing that was really fun on the club was the whole scrambled eggs thing, which if you don't know what the scrambled eggs thing, it's my husband came up with it as a visual to help you to get the motion to supple your horse. So it's kind of like just a little bit of this motion, like scrambling eggs is what you use to supple your horse. And so that like went crazy on the club. And then um, we had the scrambled eggs challenge where people had to balance on one leg and like scramble the egg with the opposite hand. So that was really fun. But anyways, the club is just so cool. And I'm so grateful to all of you guys and to my mother, Joellen, because she really helps to manage it and just make sure that it stays a really positive and educational group. That's really our goal for it is that um, we want you to be confident to kind of put a video out there or ask for feedback and that you will get constructive criticism. So certainly getting criticism is part of it, but we want it to be in a positive way and a way that you get help. So thank you all for being part of the club. The other thing that's a year old is the um, Amelia's Dressage Academy monthly workshops. So that's been really fun as well. Um, that is a paid program. Um, and I have a, a group of students where every month we focus on a different dressage topic and I publish um, exercises and then we do a live Zoom lecture. And so it's a little bit more one-on-one -on -one work with me. And that is also a year old. So that's super cool. Um, yeah, we have a lot of cool things coming up. And then we have the free webinar on the training scale that's going to be on September 12th. Be sure to sign up for that. And after that, we will open enrollment for our masterclass on the dressage training scale. So I only do that twice a year. And the masterclass is like an amazing thing. So the dressage training scale, I'm kind of curious. I want you guys to type in 
the chat and give me from one to 10 how well you feel like you understand the dressage training scale. Like one being like you think of the dressage training scale as like some mysterious thing that you probably should know more about. And 10 being like you understand every single level of the dressage training scale. You understand how all of the exercises fit into the dressage training scale and you know how to train your horse. Okay, let's see. Leslie's at a six. Augustina's at a six, eight. Okay, you guys are pretty good. So the training scale is definitely something that I, um, you know, when I first started riding dressage, I didn't know enough about. And I was actually embarrassed in a lesson with uh, George Williams because he asked me like to recite the levels of the training scale and I couldn't do it. So anyways, the training scale is awesome. Come to my free webinar. What else? Oh, you guys are all dying to know about my new horse. So I, when I went to Europe earlier, like when was that? In August, I guess, I did get a young horse and he's five. His name is Luigi, which I think is super cute because it's like the Super Mario. Like, I don't know. I didn't play a lot of Nintendo as a kid, but he just got here last week. So he flew from Amsterdam to LAX. And then he got to LAX, I think on Tuesday, he spent 48 hours in quarantine and he was released on Friday. And um, I was away at my grandmother's funeral. So I got back on Sunday and then he's been really good. It's a big adjustment for a horse coming from Holland to here. It's like, they're always a little shell shocked at first and especially the quarantine and the plane and everything's different. And so it's really important to just take the time with them when they're here. And I've been spending a lot of time with him, doing a lot of groundwork with him. Um, and little by little, he's doing really good. I had a really good ride on him today. And he has like the most amazing canter ever. Like he's super uphill and his gates are really floaty. Um, he's not a chestnut. He's like very different type than my other horses. He's more compact. And I haven't really decided I may try to resell him or I may try to keep him. So we'll just see how it goes. But that's the story on the new horse. So now you all know, I'll try to post some little video clips of him soon. Okay, so I'm going to get to your guys' questions because we have a lot of good questions. Um, and I appreciate all of your guys' questions. So the first question is from Donna. So she is asking for more information on how to use your back and elbows and not your hands. So that's a good question. And one thing that I kind of think of, which I heard someone else say one time, is to think about half halting from your shoulder blades. So that it's really like engaging your back, your upper back and squeezing your, your shoulder blades together. That is how you should ride a half halt. And, and that really helps because it helps you to stretch up and engage your core instead of just what we all tend to do is just like bend forward and then pull on the reins, which is exactly the wrong thing. So try that out. Let me know if maybe that visual helps you guys, but like think about half halting with your armpits or with your shoulder blades, and that might just help you use your body a little differently. Next question is from Marianne. Any tips on how I can not hold on the inside rein? My trainer is always telling me that I pulled on the inside rein, but my reins are the same length. Okay, so this is a great question. And I think it's really hard in dressage because our instinct, like if you want to turn your horse, your instinct is to just pull on the inside rein. But that's really exactly the wrong thing to do. Because what happens is that when you pull on the inside rein, um, it misaligns your horse. So when you pull on the inside rein, the opposite shoulder, like the outside shoulder really falls to the outside. And so your horse can no longer stay engaged. Like they can no longer stay 
inside leg to outside rein when you just pull on the inside rein. So you really have to convince yourself and also train your horse that you can turn from your outside aids. The outside aids, your outside rein and your outside leg really are the turning aids. But it's hard to start to trust those as your turning aids. And like certainly when I'm working, when I'm starting a young horse, um, you you do use a little bit your inside rein to direct them around the turn. But the more advanced that your horse gets and the more that they move up the levels, the more you really want to get to where you're turning them more from the outside rein and your outside upper leg, that's also a really important part. Um, Someone also, one of my, one of you guys wrote something where they said that the trainer told her to think about turning the saddle instead of the bridle. And that's kind of another good visual is to think about, you know, like using your outside leg and using your body turning and getting the, um, the saddle to turn instead of just pulling on the inside rein. So I hope that helps you, Marianne. What else? Um, Lola, she says, hey, Amelia, I hope you're good. I'm struggling to get my horse forward. She listens into transitions, but struggles with activity. I'm thinking of using spurs. Can you give me some tips on leg position while using them? and how to use them effectively? Good question. So there definitely is a time and a place to use spurs. So spurs are considered an auxiliary aid, which means that you shouldn't overuse them. They shouldn't be an aid, but that they should reinforce what your leg does. And just an interesting tip is that you must wear spurs at the FEI level. So I actually got disqualified one time in the pre-St. George because I was riding this little Arab and he got super hot in the warm up, and I decided to take my spurs off and I like rode through the whole test. And then the judge said, I'm sorry, I have to disqualify you because you don't have spurs on. So there is a reason for spurs, which is that they can help to reinforce your leg aid and they can be more specific because if you think about like your heel is big and the spur is small. So they can give like a more direct and specific pressure than your heel can. A couple of suggestions. If you haven't ridden with spurs, one is to make sure that you really have a good leg position and an independent seat and that your toes stay pointing forward. Because if your toes poke out a lot, then that's going to have your spur in the horse all the time. So you don't want to use your spur all the time. Again, it's an auxiliary aid. So you want to start with your calf and then only use your spur when needed. Another good suggestion is I always start with like little baby short spurs that have a round end because those are like the most mild. So that's a good place to start. And if you put the spur lower on your heel, like as opposed to above the spur rest, you can actually put the spur a little bit lower, like towards the bottom of your boot. And that will make it so that you're not using it quite as much. And then like, as you get more comfortable with the spurs, as your horse gets more used to them, you can, you know, move them a little up. But again, remember that you don't want to be overusing your spur or your horse is just going to get dull to it. So you always want to start with your calf, your heel, then correct them with the spur. But remember that it's an auxiliary aid. It's not an aid. So I hope that helps. Okay, next question is from Heidi. So she is struggling with her contact and her seat. How do I get contact? Okay, this is a hard question. But definitely your seat is related to contact. So when we talk about contact, that's basically from your elbow to the horse's mouth. Like what you feel in your hand, that's contact. And you need to have a good seat and an independent seat in order to establish a steady contact with your horse. Because it's kind of like um, your seat and your pelvis kind of move a little bit independently. 
from your shoulders. So I think about that, like keep your shoulders still and your seat moves around with the horse while your shoulders stay still and you're able to establish a steady contact with your horse. So hopefully that helps. And then, you know, getting contact is a process. So it's not something that, you know, you're like, okay, today I'm going to start riding dressage and your contact's going to be perfect. I remember when I like, I started out riding dressage as a kid. Then I went to Western riding for a while. And when I came back to dressage, it was hard to understand like contact and connection again. And I always felt like I was pulling on my horse. So it's a process. And I also think that it's important to educate your horse correctly about the contact and the connection. And I like to do groundwork a lot. So I'm a big fan of groundwork. Um, and especially if your horse doesn't really understand the contact and they don't understand like how to give to the pressure of the bit, then groundwork is super helpful. Okay. Uh, Christine, can you explain the half halt muscles again? Also in the walk, would you give the half halt when the inside hind is stepping under? Okay. So let's see. Dark horse here says I need to do more groundwork. Yes. Groundwork is like so important. I've been thinking that I should do like a whole course on dressage groundwork because I think it's so much people think that groundwork is only for like, um, Western. And that's where I learned a lot of my groundwork was through natural horsemanship, but it's so important for dressage and also for just like your general safety and enjoyment of your horse, because the majority of the time that you spend with your horse is on the ground and they need to be respectful and they need to be safe. And, um, it makes them much more enjoyable to be around. So yes, I see you guys want groundwork course. Okay. <laughs> we'll work on that. Um, let's see. Carrie says, my mare has improved so much with the tips you've given. We've been rehabbing from an SI issue. Good. I'm glad to hear you. And I'm always so happy um, to hear from you guys and to hear that it's helpful. Like, I'll get to your question, Christine. But I was um, talking to Christine earlier and to a few other people this week. And it's like, it's really amazing that I can like help people that I've never even met, like people on the other side of the world and that they're like, oh, you've helped me so much. And I honestly never thought that this would all be possible. So, okay, back to the half halt. If you haven't watched my YouTube video yet this week, um, watch it because it's all about the half halt, which is like this mysterious thing. But um. I work with a physical therapist. She helped me do the master class on rider position. And she's really good at explaining your muscles and helping you to understand what muscles you actually need to use when you're riding. So we all think, like, think about it. If you're going to ride a half halt, what's your kind of go-to muscle groups? Uh, I think a lot of us... Um, think about our biceps, right? We think about our six packs abs. And then we kind of think about like squeezing with our thighs and our knees to get a half halt. So that's not really the right muscles that you should be using. And that's a lot about what this video's, um, this week's YouTube video is about. So when you ride a half halt, you want to think about your outer leg and your glute knee. So the muscles that actually wrap your legs around the horse is um, your glute med, which is like not your glute max, right? Because if you squeeze your butt, like if you're sitting here right now, if you squeeze your glute, gluteus maximus, it pushes you out of your chair. So you don't want to use that to ride a half halt because it's going to pop your butt out of the saddle. You want to kind of wrap your legs around the horse. So that's your glute med muscle. And I was helping um, one of my students, Sylvia, today, helping her feel that glute med muscle. A great way to do that is to just take your feet out of the stirrups and then try to lift your legs, like do it one leg at a time, but just lift your whole leg out of the saddle 
a few times and you'll start to feel kind of this burning like in your in the outside of your butt cheek. So that's your glute med. So your glute med is really important for half halting. And it's also really important for getting your leg on the horse and for stabilizing your seat in the saddle. So um, we talk a lot about this in my rider position masterclass. And um, we give a lot of specific exercises that you guys can do when you're not riding to kind of awaken this muscle. So that's super helpful. So then as far as your abs, um, if you think about your six packs abs, like your crunching abs, that's if you contract those too much, it kind of folds you a little bit forward. So you actually, to ride a half halt, you want to use more your like oblique and your transverse abs. So like the abs that are on the, the side of your um, torso to help stabilize you in the saddle so that you can ride a half halt. And um, these half halts are really important for especially downward transitions. I think that's like where I really feel like I'm using these muscles. So check out the video. Hopefully that helps you, Christine. Okay. Um, let's see, Suzanne, have you ever struggled with training a young horse to accept canter in the direction they le like least, which is usually the right lead? How do you break things down into small bits? I'm glad you asked this, Suzanne. Seriously, next Wednesday's YouTube video is all about picking up the correct canter lead. So watch that video. And um, again, this came from Suzanne's question and then from someone else asked a question about it on Amelia's Dressage Club. So uh, yeah, stay tuned for my YouTube video next week about right lead canter. Uh, let's see. Shari says the rider position class has helped me so much. Your rider position scores went from a five to six to seven. That's so awesome, Shari. I'm wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's that's really cool. And it's really important like your that you are always working on your rider position because that's what defines you as a good rider. So and also just taking care of your body and strengthening your body and keeping your body symmetrical is really, really important for you guys as riders. Okay, next question is from Chantel. I have always had a following hand and hip. I've been made aware that my following hip action is too much. So now I don't know what to do with my hips. What would you suggest? Okay, this is a good question. So I always say to you guys that, oh, my shirt's really dirty. Obviously, I didn't change after the barn today. Okay, so your seat is not a driving aid. So you should not go around and be like shoving at your horse with your seat and your pelvis because it just looks really, really wrong, really bad. But your seat should absorb the motion of the horse. So I guess that's the difference is that you're, you do need to have a following hip and elbow and your seat does need to follow exactly what the saddle is doing. So exactly whatever your horse is back and the saddle is doing, your hips need to follow that, but not more. And it's really important that if you want your horse to go more forward, if you um, need to apply a driving aid, that the driving aid is just from your leg and not from your seat. So hopefully that helps you. I would say most riders tend to not move enough with their hips, but there are some riders that are just like super loosey goosey and maybe move a little too much with their seat. So let's see. Cyan says here, I love the snowman exercise. It has helped my gelding so much and it is fun to ride. Yes. Amen. I love the snowman exercise too. If you don't know what the snowman exercise is, go to my YouTube channel, search for my name and the snowman. I, um, I learned the snowman exercise at a clinic with Conrad Schumacher and I was riding my old horse and he was so bad at the clinic. He was like really attached to his friend and he was super nervous and tense and not with me. So Conrad Schumacher had me do that exercise and it was like 
really helped. And since then, I've taught it to like all my horses and all my students. So yay, we love the snowman. Okay. Um, next question is from Barb. Do you recommend a certain brand or type of splint boots or do you prefer polar wraps? Okay, this is like a loaded question because, um, you know, it's funny. If you read the research, both the boots and polar wraps, they actually make the tendons and the ligaments hotter, which is not a good thing. So there's like definitely some debate about how good it really is to put polos or splint boots on your horses. I will say that splint like boots are better for protection. So if you have a horse that has like splints or that has a tendency to whack their legs together, then boots are better. Um, if you have a horse that I feel like horses that tend to get um, like wind puffs or kind of puffy in their joints, then I would prefer polos. And when I do polos, I always put a the bandage underneath, like an Escrajon bandage underneath. It's like, it's got like foam strips because that helps um, so that the tendons don't get too hot. So some horses I put boots on, boots are a lot easier. Some horses I put polos on, but there's definitely debate about which is better or if they're even good at all. So I don't know, maybe you guys have some suggestions. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Anne says exercises to develop a stronger canter. I need more from behind. Lots of transitions. So if you need to work on your canter, like trot canter, trot transitions, starting with walk canter transitions is a really way to get your horse um, more engaged with the hind end. So lots of transitions. Uh, okay, let's see. Dark Horse here says, I scored a 64 with second place in my last test. That's awesome. I watch Amelia's test before I ride and imagine my seat as great as hers. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so glad to hear that, um, that, the, that the videos are helpful. And I do the same thing. I think that like visualizing and studying and watching really good riders is amazingly helpful. Um, so I do the same thing. I'll sit down and watch a rider that I admire, a test that's really good before I do my test. And it does. It really, it really helps. So yay. Good for you. Okay. Um, what else? Okay. Haley has a good question. So I recently started a new barn job, have been working in retail before. It's also been too hot and humid to really ride. I'm feeling really demotivated. Any advice? Okay, I want you guys to know on a scale from one to 10, how motivated are you with your riding? Maybe you're more motivated after watching the Facebook Live. I'm not sure. Um, so demotivated. I don't know. I just, for me, like, I think I'm addicted to riding. Like I seriously, if I don't ride for a few days, I like start to get really grumpy. So I really love riding. And I think that you just have to like, sometimes I get unmotivated when I feel like, you know, I'm never going to be good enough or like, I'm never going to reach my goals or I, I'm just suck and my horse isn't good enough. So, okay. You guys are all at eight and nine motivation. Yes, ride in the morning. I highly recommend riding in the morning. Um, that's one thing that I do is I really try to ride my horses in the morning because if I don't, it's um, it's just like chaos at my barn. So I try to just take that quiet time in the morning to ride my own horses. Lucy's at a 10 of motivation. <laughs> Catherine's at an 8. Okay, Christine's at an 11. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you guys are all so motivated. Morning rides. <laughs> you guys are all at 10's motivations. That's awesome. But I think that that it is like, you know, having community, having inspiration, like watching a video or like watching, I don't know about you guys, but I was watching um, 
the world breeding championships and all the young horses going. And that is so motivating. Like Charlotte Fry on that six-year-old was so motivating to watch her ride that horse. And I think that that's one place that I get motivated watching other top riders. I get motivated by my community. So like by you guys on the club or by other people around me or by my clients. Um, so yeah, let's uh, keep each other motivated. Um, what else? Oh yeah, if you haven't signed up for my free webinar, it's going to be Sunday, September 12th. Here's the link, ameliasdressageacademy.com forward slash training scale webinar. We're going to have some free prizes. And like I said before, the training scale is like the key. The training scale, you have to know it. You have to understand it. You have to like just have it ingrained in your head for every horse you ride, whether it's a young horse or an FEI horse. It's something that I teach all of my students and it's super important. So I hope to see you at the webinar. And I heard my husband just got home. He caught some more halibut yesterday. So we're going to have halibut fish tacos. And what else? You guys are all amazing. It's so fun to have all of you. I'm so excited. I have so much great content coming your way. So many exciting things coming. And yeah, so let's all keep each other motivated. And I'll see you next Thursday, same time, same place. And enjoy your horses this week. Bye, everyone.